welcome to the to the webinar series of the Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub. As COVID-19 affects every country in Southeast Asia, researchers are challenged to use their skills to understand the various ways the pandemic affects our societies. Research can also provide valuable solutions to the problems that we face today. Now, despite the circumstances, now is the time when up-to-date research on the impact of the virus is most needed in the Philippines and the entire region. The driving force of this webinar series is the desire to serve during these trying times. We want to make data available to government, policymakers, NGOs, and people who are capable of advising this. Now, this webinar is on the topic of responding to COVID-19 through socialistic measures, a preliminary review. But before I introduce our speaker, first, I'd like to state that the opinions expressed in this webinar are those of the speakers. I mean, the, the webinar series are those of the speakers. They do not purport, purport to reflect the opinions or views of search or its members. Our objective is to provide a space for the academic discussion of various issues that we consider to be relevant and interesting. Now, to our participants, should you have any questions, please um, post your questions at any time in the public chat. Okay, there's a public chat space in Zoom. Um, please tell us your full name and your country. Okay, because right now we have participants from across the Philippines and Indonesia. Now, please take note that this webinar will be recorded. It is being recorded and that you're able to watch it la again later through the Facebook page of the De La Salle University Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub. Okay, thank you. So let me introduce our speaker this afternoon. He is a Filipino Marxist writer, researcher, activist, and professor. He was chosen Mananaysay ng Taon or Essayist of the Year 2009 and Makata ng Taon or Poet of the Year 2010 by the Commission ng Wikang Filipino or the Commission on the Filipino Language. He is a full professor at the Filipino, Filipino or Philippine Studies Department of De La Salle University and is the fourth congressional nominee of the ACT Teachers Party List in the 2016 elections which has two seats in the Philippine Congress. So without much further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Michael M. San Juan. Good afternoon, Dr. San Juan. Good afternoon to all participants in this uh, webinar series on COVID-19. Uh, my uh, paper is entitled Responding to COVID-19 Through Socialist Measures, a Preliminary Review. And this is actually an updated version of a paper that I drafted during the early weeks of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. Now we have the objectives of the lecture. The first objective is to narrate my personal path to socialism as a Filipino Roman Catholic and thereby open such path to fellow Filipinos and or Catholics too. Second objective is to provide practical definitions of socialism, both current and historical. Third objective is to discuss the socialistic responses to the COVID-19 pandemic in the Philippines and beyond. So we have examples from other parts of the world. And lastly, we want to convince earthlings, our fellow citizens worldwide, that socialism is the only viable way forward now. My journey towards socialism started when I was in high school. My alma mater is a Catholic school beside a cathedral. Next slide, please. Our values education classes include discussions on papal or social encyclicals that criticize both capitalism and socialism, uh, such as Rerum Novarum and Pacem and Teres, for example, written by uh, Pope Leo XIII and Pope John the 13th, or 23rd, rather. 
Next slide, please. Then and now, I focus on the encyclicals and incisive critic of capitalism. And you can see in this slide, Pope Leo XIII's segment in Rerum Novarum, which traces the evils of poverty to the capitalist greed and a tiny elite's monopoly of wealth. We can read some portions. It has come to pass that working men have been surrendered, isolated and helpless to the hard-heartedness of employers and the greed of unchecked competition. He also says, a small number of very rich men have been able to lay upon the teeming masses of the laboring poor a yoke little better than that's that of slavery itself. So he actually equated capitalism with slavery. Next slide, please. Also, I still subscribe to Pope or St. John the 23rd's emphasis on worker empowerment and participation as vital elements of the political process as laid down in his encyclical Mater et Magistra or Mother and Teacher. In this context, Pope or St. John the 23rd would have praised the Philippines' labor leaders turned legislators from figures such as Senator Isabella de los Reyes to Manila Councilor Amado V. Hernandez, who also became a national artist later, and also the late Congressman Crispin Beltran. And probably the Pope would have remarked that we need to elect more of them, more people like them. Next slide, please. As a Filipino teacher, I am required to be immersed in Philippine social realist novels such as Jose Rizal's El Filibusterismo and Amado V. Hernandez's Mga Ibong Mandaragit, which has an English translation with the title Birds of Prey. So this is actually a, a masteral thesis by Estelita Pangilinan available in the archives of the University of Santo Tomas, but it is yet to be published, although a copy of the thesis is still there. El filibusterismo is, of course, sympathetic to peasants and is against greedy landlords, as you all know, while Hernandez's Mga Ibong Mandaragit is its logical sequel, as the latter continues where the former left off. The last scene of El filibusterismo had Padre Florentino throwing away Simon's treasure chest into the sea, uttering a prayer for it to be revealed and salvaged in the future for a good cause. In Mang Ibong Mandaragit, the main character, Mando Plaridel, was able to recover Simon's wealth, and indeed, he used it for good causes. He established Kampilan, which literally means cutlass or slashing sword, a newspaper that comforts the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, so to speak. So in our times, Kampilan would be very similar to Rappler or other similar media firms. Mando Plaridel also helped the socialist academic Dr. Sabio in establishing Freedom University, a people-centered university dedicated to solving the country's social problems. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, through Renato Constantino's history books, I first encountered Isabella de los Reyes' colorful character. Eventually, I stumbled, I stumbled upon the digitized copies of its fascinating nationalist and internationalist workers' newspaper, La Redención del Obrero, or in English, Workers' Redemption. It was published from October 1903 to February 1904, and it's still available in Spain's digital newspaper library. It's available online. Next slide, please. And I would like you to search about this, but yeah, this is available online. The December 10, 1903 issue of La Redención del Obrero gives the following simple definition of socialism. And that is why uh, this newspaper is really interesting. It talks about socialism and other ideological matters, and it's written in Spanish and Tagalog. The meaning of socialists is the organization of workers that are larger and broader in all countries that want the working class to have a share in the fruits of their labor within the bounds of justice and established law. 
and through work, study, and savings. Because without their sweat, not one factory, trading firm, and country will advance and develop. And I think this is still a, a very valid definition of uh, socialism, considering that socialists still consider this as a goal for the working class to have a bigger share, if not the total share of the fruits of their labor. Next slide, please. Hence, we can actually say that at least one of our country's brains was a socialist with international links too. And for those interested, uh, two books by Mohares and Anderson will present related details. So the first book by uh, Mohares is entitled Brains of the Nation. It's about Pedro Paterno, D.H. Uh, Pardo de Tavera, Isabella de los Reyes, and the production of modern, modern knowledge in the Philippines. So it's, about, it's a story about how the nation was built on the brains or on, on the ideas of these citizens, of these people these thinkers. Also, the second book is The Age of Globalization, Anarchists, and the Anti-Colonial Imagination by Benedict Anderson. Next slide, please. In some Philippine studies graduate courses that I teach, Teresa Jimenez Maceda's book on local peasant labor party's history through songs is a staple reading. And Maceda's work includes a Filipino translation of Lino Dison's Passion Ding Talapagobra, or Workers' Passion, which some call as the Red or Socialist Passion too. Allow me to read some verses which I translated from Filipino. Next slide, please. So in this slide, you can see the original in Kapampangan, the language of Pampanga, and, and at the right corner, you have the Filipino translation by uh, Teresa Jimenez Maceda. Next slide. Now I will read the, my uh, rough translation in English. This is from the segment, The Capitalist Government is Against Jesus Christ. In the government of the rich, all throughout humankind, there is always chaos, hunger and poverty, plunder and killings. So again, this is from the Red Passion or the Workers' Passion, written originally in Kapampanga and translated in Filipino. And some segments have been translated also in English. And, and these are staple reading materials in literature classes and some Philippine studies graduate courses. Next slide, please. And the Philippines' huge income and wealth gaps then and now also compel academics to really take seriously or even embrace socialism in my case. Similarly, there's no question about it. The same social ills fueled the raging communist insurgency in the country, one of the world's longest running at more than 50 years now. So this is the reason why we still have the insurgency today. As Thomas Africa concludes in his research, the income split at the median has been at 82 is to 18 to 80 is to 20 in favor of the families at the upper 50% over the past 50 years. So, or simply put, there's no fundamental change in wealth distribution for at least half a century in the Philippines, as the data would say. More recent data from the Philippine Statistics Authority and the World Bank would present the same bleak reality of inegalitarian income and wealth distribution. Next slide, please. As PSA notes, that we only have 321,000 rich households, a very tiny percentage of our population, while there are 13.4 million low-income households in the country. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, the World Bank says that for the past two decades, the richest 20% of the population consistently control more than 50% of the national income, while the poorest 20% holds just consistently holds just 5% of the national income. Next slide, please. And the huge gap between the local capitalists' wealth, massive wealth, no? and the country's measly minimum wage remains the same too, as presented in this slide. So the lowest minimum wage is in Region 8, and it's only 230 pesos, the real minimum, the current real 
amount of minimum wage is only 230 pesos for plantation workers in Region 8. And compare it with the big wealth or the huge wealth of the landlords, the capitalists in the Philippines, and the huge gap between the richest and the poorest in the Philippines would be further revealed. Next slide, please. Finally, the 1987 Philippine Constitution's egalitarian ethos also provides ammunition to those with socialist inclinations in the Philippines. You can just read the beautiful preamble of the Constitution. Also, the pro-labor provisions in Article 13, Section 3. We also have the pro-rural land reform provisions in Arti Article 13 and Section 4. And also the pro-urban land reform provisions in Article 13, Section 9. So all these can be interpreted as at least socialistic, if not socialist. And hence, as COVID-19 was, uh, next slide please, was officially declared as a global pandemic, Bible read readers would have reminded themselves of that nice quote from Philippians 2 verse 4. Where, when thinking of how to respond to the crisis, so the quote is, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Socialists would also have instantly remembered L Rosa Luxemburg's popular quote, a choice between socialism or barbarism. Choose socialism and withstand the chance to survive and even flourish after the pandemic is eradicated. Choose the status quo where third world politicians are able to get tested for COVID-19 even if they have no symptoms or where the elderly stare at grocery shelves emptied by other shoppers, just like in first world countries like the United Kingdom. And we will probably descend into the law of the jungle, kill or be killed barbarism of capitalism. And going back to the quote from the Bible, it gives people a hint on where people of the book, Bible readers should stand. Within this context, this short uh, presentation is primarily aimed at convincing more and more people that especially in this time of the pandemic, of course, we want to choose socialism because free market and profit motive is equals to barbarism and we, we don't want that. Next slide, please. Now we go to the definitions of socialism. Merriam-Webster provides a clear contemporary and primary definition of socialism. Any of various economic and political theories advocating collective or governmental ownership and administration of the means of production and distribution of goods. And actually such definition runs parallel with more traditional and typical academic definitions. Thus, as Amin notes, movements towards socialism aim to abolish the system based on private proprietorship over the modern means of production or capital in order to replace it with a system based on workers' social proprietorship and may also involve mobilization aimed at real and significant transformation of the relations between labor employed by capital and capital which employs the workers. It is in this context that the socialistic measures employed to contain and hopefully eventually defeat COVID-19 need immediate attention. Using Antonio Gramsci's language, the current crisis is an opportunity for socialists to step up the war of maneuver against capitalism, especially in the public consciousness. When capitalism is slowly being seen as the incubator of pandemics, when capitalism is slowly uh, being considered as the root cause of COVID-19. Pushing socialism into the mainstream becomes more logical and possible. Next slide, please. At least two countries have went beyond private ownership by using state power to nationalize private hospitals and supervise the operations of face mask factories. The Spanish government temporarily nationalized all private hospitals and healthcare providers in a bid to combat the rapid spread of the coronavirus. Such move is expected to speed up and rationalize healthcare in a time of crisis. Had Spain allowed the chaos of free market healthcare to rule, they would have far more COVID-19 deaths. And 
And luckily now, they have somehow flattened the curve, at least relatively speaking. Meanwhile, Taiwan, a bastion of Asian capitalism, mobilized its armed forces to help increase the supply of surgical masks. Such intervention is expected to help Taiwan reach the target of producing 13 million face masks each day. Had Taiwan failed to act, face masks there will be very costly and certainly people will go unprotected just like what's happening in the Philippines now. Because in the Philippines, face masks were only 8 pesos a piece before the pandemic. And now at the height of the pandemic, the typical face mask would sold at 28 pesos per piece. So that's capitalism for you folks. Next slide, please. The pandemic led to company shutdowns, job displacements, reduction in income, and so on. To provide instant economic relief to those affected by the crisis, some governments have suspended the profit motive. Capitalism itself, by ordering a temporary freeze in the price of basic commodities and a short-term stoppage of rent, mortgage, and utilities bill payments. So in the Philippines, we have a price freeze in basic commodities. But as mentioned, with regard to face mask, uh, the, the price freeze is basically a go signal for the capitalists to raise their charges. Meanwhile, in New York, the, the state government issued a 90-day moratorium on evictions of any residential or commercial tenants. While these measures at, are at the very most temporary and crisis bound, they help people imagine what a future socialist world would look like and feel like. Prospectively, of course, a better version of current and historical social systems, socialist systems rather, a world where no one has to rent a home because he or she can have his or her own. And no one has to pay utility bills because utilities are basically free or uh, considered as publicly funded social services. Next slide, please. Prior to the spread of the coronavirus, Many homeless citizens in both first and third world countries are routinely in, ignored by most governments. Bureaucrats were only compelled to act when they realized that the homeless are very vulnerable to the virus, considering that many people are asymptomatic no? or, or people who are carriers of the virus without them knowing it. In Manila, De La Salle University, in partnership with a religious order, has transformed a portion of its campus to a temporary sanctuary for the homeless. In the United States, they converted some trailers and also leased some hotels to provide emergency shelter to the homeless. And the United Kingdom also did this to some hotels in, 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 their, in their country. And they converted hotels into 45,000 self-contained accommodation spaces for the homeless. Temporary homeless shelters can do for now as governments work towards the establishment of enough permanent homes for everyone until homeless shelters become a phrase of the past in a prospectively ideal socialist future. Next slide, please. As governments imposed quarantines and lockdowns to limit the spread of the virus, it became more obvious that more workers will have to stop from working or will be displaced from work, just like what happened in the Philippines. And it also became clear that those displaced can, can't fend for themselves, especially that the crisis could last for months, probably even a year or two. For a three-month period, the Danish government, say for example, promised to cover 75% of the salaries of most employees. And for hourly workers, they actually shouldered 90% of the wages. And for a similar period, the UK government would pay grants covering up to 80% of the salaries of workers if companies keep them on their payroll rather than lay them off. Despite the innate limitations of such government interventions under, under the dominant uh, neoliberal capitalist system, these broad strokes are now somehow better than the government's responses to the 2008 global financial crisis because then the, the only goal is to save the businesses. Now, during the pandemic, the goal is to save the businesses so as to retain the workers. Next slide, please. 
privatized healthcare has been fatal for the poor then and now. The stakes against privatized healthcare and for a free public healthcare system are higher now because bluntly speaking, as this is a global pandemic, the rich and the powerful can ignore can only ignore the rest at their peril. No one is safe for as long as everyone is saved. Even just one coronavirus carrier left untreated or ignored can restart a global pandemic. So we have to save everyone. And the only way to do it is to have a single payer scheme. And it can it can be a good role model for countries like the Philippines, especially that our current system always runs the risk of for profit private hospitals draining the funds of our public health insurance. If all countries will emulate socialist Cuba's focus on healthcare and engage in international solidarity work too, no global pandemic is unbeatable. Another pandemic is always lurking somewhere and a socialist healthcare system that prioritizes people over profit would surely help us survive this better. Next slide, please. Reacting to countries resorting to lockdowns as the primary response to the spread of COVID-19, the Director General of the World Health Organization reiterated a simple message for the country, test, 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 or what we call in the Philippines as mass testing. As the government admits, the Philippines lacks the capacity to conduct mass testing, primarily because of the general weakness of research and development common in many third world countries that fail to catch up with developed countries. We have to import materials for testing after suffering from long periods of colonialism and even neo-colonialism in our case. Nevertheless, somehow punching beyond their weight, considering their lack of enough financial resources, the state-funded University of the Philippines was able to develop cheaper testing kits. Meanwhile, profit-oriented firms cannot be trusted with mass testing. And in fact, in the Philippine case, they offered no help in concretizing mass testing. As a matter of fact, we are yet to have mass testing plans in the Philippines, and the private sector is offering no help with regard to mass testing. Public agencies and universities can thus play a major role in accelerating mass testing. Hence, more public funding for public universities a staple socialist advocacy is a must in these times. Now we go to the postscript or the updates. Next slide. The socialistic reforms were mostly short-lived, unfortunately. They were meant to stave off total economic collapse and at least save humankind from total annihilation. In most cases, the reform succeeded in preventing total economic and social collapse. That's why we're still here, because of the ayuda, because of the aid, because of these socialistic policies. And as of this writing, next slide, total annihilation is still theoretically possible, but calls for international cooperation on developing medicines or vaccines seem to inculcate a clear lesson. At least the core idea of socialistic cooperation based on human needs rather than wants, collective brainstorming rather than action uh, led by just one country. At least worldwide, this is a very popular idea. And, and world leaders are seemingly agreeing on this, at least on this very basic matter, with a few exceptions. Hence, there is still a great opening for socialism and socialist policies. Big, bold ideas are now the staples of economics. Bland neoliberalism and possibly even fiscal conservatism is now bankrupt and dead. Next slide. The next few months will still be crisis time. Millions will still be unemployed or will have their incomes reduced. Hence, state intervention in the, in the economy will be a must. Advocating for socialist and even or socialistic reforms will be attuned with, with these state-led interventions that tend to be generally redistributive despite their limitations. These are generally redistributive, such as direct cash transfers or universal basic income or even wage subsidy, for example. It is very easy to link this current relief schemes to broader and more encompassing socialistic policies such as labor control, or cooperativization of industrial firms. 
So, another thing, all these things are setting a precedent. So now we can say that the government can actually help resolve all the major social problems that we have. It can use state machinery, the, the, the central bank, and all the money that we have to resolve the problems that we have. So we can actually create or craft a socialist state, even a socialist world, through this process. Of course, it's a long march from here, but we can march together towards that path. Next slide, please. Neoliberal regimes, including nominally social democratic governments that in reality implement neoliberal policies too, in charge of pandemic response, generally failed to beat the virus and are now facing massive protests, as in the case of France, say, for example. And they also failed to save millions from hunger and destitution in the case of the Philippines. Say, for example, no? despite the ayuda or the aid, many of our countrymen are still suffering from hunger and destitution and also joblessness. Be it in the balance of the socialism and socialist policies as the pandemic's lessons are revealed in current history. Humankind's prospective decimation because of COVID-19, coupled with the ever-looming problem of extreme climate change and its ill effects, all the more compelled us to take such responsibility more seriously, as it is now very clear, as, as the song goes, we're all in this together. We rise and fall together, and perhaps after decades of failed individualist neoliberalism, it's better to attempt to rise together through the national, natural ideology of solidarity, none other than socialism. Now more than ever, conditions are ripe for the accelerated broadening of, or deepening of networks for the intensive campaign and the organizing work of broad-based labor-led social movements, which are capable of influencing policymakers and or altering existing power structures towards shaping a socialist world in the hopefully imminent future. And I invite you all to join or participate in this process of shaping or building the socialist world. Next slide. For more information, uh, yeah, you can download this the, the, the full article with the full references in my research gate site. And, and there's also my WordPress site. You, th there's also my email. I'm also a regular writer at squeeze.ph, so you, you might consider uh, viewing that site. So thank you very much for listening. And I'm ready for your questions if you have any. And I think that we have two reactors. Thank you very much, Dr. San Juan, for that very interesting lecture. Uh, we now proceed to the reactions. Our first reactor is a PhD candidate in public administration at Shanghai Jiao Tong University School of International and Public Affairs. His research interests and publications are in political theory and philosophy, comparative politics, and public policy. So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Anthony Lawrence Borja. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. And again, thank you, Dr. Sun Wan, for your very insightful paper. Again, we are looking to looking at a possible future. Uh, every crisis would always present its own opportunities. Uh, Dr. Sun Wan's presentation has provided an overview of, its, of the potentials we have to provide an effective response to the current pandemic. The measures he presented and proposed uh, drew from Christian and socialist ideals as well as experiences of other countries, uh, thus providing at least two pictures. On one hand is the image of a new normal with a more active government in place. On the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, is the presence of both policy potentials and available resources for a more effective response to the current COVID crisis. Uh, my task for this reaction is to raise the political question. I mean, we all have these ideals, we have these potentials, we have this opportunity to create something new. But again, the reality of the Philippines is, question is simple. Do we even have a government capable or willing to go those ends. Uh, these two portraits, on one hand, the uh, 
portrait of a new normal, on your hand is the current potentials, these two portraits boils down to the twin issues of politics and governance. Uh, to elaborate, Dr. Sun Won uh, practiced what uh, Wallerstein and Tambidi would call utopistics. Now, uh, just a, an overview, uh, utopistics is an analytical approach wherein you draw or envision a future based on current conditions and our understanding of such conditions, meaning the limits and potentials that the present has. Uh, applying the same approach, I would like to focus on two issues from Dr. Sunwan's presentation. Uh, three issues, make, that, uh, make those three issues. Uh, first, do we have, as I've said earlier, do we have a government capable of doing such things? Local governments right now have stood up to the challenge, especially in Metro Manila. But then again, the national government obviously falls short on many accounts, ranging from confused public announcements to faulty policies to basically focusing on anything else other than the pandemic. Second, and in relation to the latter, is the issue of nationalizing hospitals. Uh, I'm going to go here to a more public policy perspective. Uh, I do agree that uh, nationalizing hospitals is a, is a would be, we would benefit much from it. But then again, practicing utopistics, we must recognize at least three possibilities based on three assumptions. First, we can assume that the government is capable and willing. If we do assume this, the potential would be the possibility is that we would have an effective public health system, public hospitals that can provide access and high quality services. Second, we can, I think this is happening in other countries. The second option would be if we assume that the government is capable, but whose willingness is based on other issues, other factors. And I would raise the example of China right now. Uh, China's government is capable of providing public health services, but its willingness to provide a more even, evenly distributed uh, high quality services is, have been lagging for the past few decades. Their response to the current COVID crisis has been to an extent selective. I'll, I'll just give you an example. Uh, on one hand, you have, again, Beijing right now is going to another wave on the other hand, you have the city of Shanghai, wherein COVID cases have been very minimal and their response is effective. Again, in putting the government as at the forefront of reform, if you put the government at the forefront of reform, you risk this possibility of selective application. Uh, the quality of government, their willingness. Again, you're giving so much power to the government at this point if you are to adopt the nationalization of hospitals. So it depends on the capacity and the willingness of the government. The third option is we assume that the government is neither capable or willing, neither capable nor willing to adopt such policies. Uh, I think the case of the Philippines would be much closer to that one. So if we would apply it here, there may be some adverse, if not disastrous results to nationalizing healthcare. But then again, these are, these are options. I'm not saying that I'm against nationalizing healthcare. It's just we must realize our, uh, the limits, the current political limits that we have right now in terms of, again, quality of our national government to be more specific. Lastly, uh, last point I would like to raise would be the provision of fiscal support to businesses. Uh, my question for Dr. Sun Wan is, should we provide resources or fiscal support to labor unions instead, especially for large corporations? Should we provide it to cooperative federal uh, federations in the Philippines right now? The thing is, capitalism is not only about the profit motive on one hand, and on the other hand, capitalism is capable of adapting and harnessing crisis. If we are to let these corporations survive, especially the big ones, by providing fiscal support to them, it is not an assurance that they will not revert back to their ways. It doesn't assure that the profit motive would be, would be eliminated. If we are to break the dominance of the profit motive, uh, which is the op opportunity that we have right now, then it requires an overhauling of businesses on one hand and the strengthening of alternative entities on the other, uh, specifically worker-owned, worker-managed enterprises, even social enterprises. 
So we have an opportunity right now. So should we redirect our efforts towards building those alternatives instead of, again, relying on existing industries, providing them, again, stimulus packages, hoping that they will not revert back to what they did before? Now, if regarding worker-owned uh, enterprises, we can look at the cases of the Mondragon Corporation in Spain, current performance of uh, Western worker enterprises to show that this alternative enterprises can match, can match the productivity and the performance of traditional corporations and traditional capitalist corporations, ranging from the big ones to small, medium enterprises. But, uh, in conclusion, again, I, the, the lingering problem that I have is the, the capacity of the government right now. If we are to adopt socialist policies, we must ensure that the government, the institutions of the state, especially the national government, is actually populated, run by, handled by actors who share the same ideals, or at the very least capable of adopting what we call already new normal, uh, new normal policies right now. So again, the political question is the lingering issue that we must face as far as Dr. Salomon's paper is concerned. And that's all. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Borja. You. Uh, Dr. San Juan, you can respond to the points raised by Mr. Borja after we hear the reaction of, or the reactions of Dr. Andy. Okay, so let me introduce our next reactor. He's a historian and lecturer at the Sociology Department, Faculty of Social and Political Science, Universitas Nacional in Indonesia. His interests are concentrated on colonial history, nationalism, and the anti-colonial movement at the, term, at the turn of the 20th century in Indonesia. In addition to his academic interests, he is also an active national member uh, of the executive board of the Masyarakat Sajarawan Indonesia, or the Society of Indonesian Historians, and managing editor of the journal Sajara, the official journal of the MSI. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Andy Aktian. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Fernando. Good afternoon for everyone. It is nice to be here and I would like to say thank you for very much to the La Salle University for the invitation to this webinar. Uh, as reactor, I want to make and highlight several points to Dr. San Juan preliminary review about socialistic measures in responding to COVID-19. Uh, my point is, yeah, we have seen the socialistic experience in facing the pandemic. And the big question is how to sustain it which I believe lies in the problems of how the organized class politics in every countries affected by COVID-19 involving the unions and labor masses react to this problem. But in general, term, I would like to say that Dr. San Juan paper and presentation is really topical and timely that all of us experience today. But what is more important from our discussion is the way speaker analyze the problem yet yeah. There was a lot of discussion already yeah, in the mainstream media about how we should deal with COVID-19. There were discussion about the global race to find vaccine or medicine to cure the victims, uh, the way quarantine implemented and the success story or the worst scenario and experience faced by different countries in the world. But few from those analysis and discussion that try to question the basic problem of our health, health system and policy and I think in a more fundamental way. So what I have found so far is in the existing analysis in the mainstream media and perspective was a few that are taken for granted about our prevailing commercialized health system that remains untouched in the technocratic neoliberal point of view or analysis. Weeks ago, uh, I followed discussion that offer a historical perspective the same webinar from the, the La Salle, yeah, to the pandemic in Southeast Asia, organized by uh, Philippine Historical Association and Masyarakat Sejarawan. And speakers at the webinar highlighted the same and continued problems during the pandemic, yeah, both in colonial and current situation regarding the access to health by the poor and lower class group in this region. We had any doubt 
health system in many Southeast Asian countries, I think, uh, with exception of socialist states like Vietnam, is a system that put health as a commodity and health system is organized in the way other industry under capitalist system is organized. Uh, so Dr. Tonton here opened this fail by solving the capitalistic or commercial health system is the bankruptcy of uh, commercialized health system and uh, which doesn't work in dealing with COVID-19. Uh, also shown in previous uh, experience during the colonial and yeah, uh, current situation. And I think that David uh, San Juan paper on socialistic measure in responding to COVID-19. So it is still in preliminary analysis underlying an interesting fact that government in every country took socialistic measure to deal with this pandemic. His presentation offer in detail various stages where the socialistic measures were taken, such as nationalization of hospital and mass factory, taking care of the homeless and feeding the poor. So what can we say about it? <clears throat> uh, son by, uh, as stated by Han Wan in overall, I think our, our prevalent, our prevalent commercial health system failed and could not work in dealing with pandemic crisis. However, which I think will be our problem in the future, there is something missing in this process or in this uh, uh, presentation, the presence of organized class and radical politics to advance this emergency, quote unquote, socialistic measure into an established system in our society. As shown by uh, San Juan, all of the socialistic measure were taken by government. It was, it was an initiative from above. And I think here the problem lies. We could not guarantee whether this measure is still in place once the pandemic COVID-19 gone. I'm afraid that those government will return to business as usual. As the first reactor also stated that uh, referred back to our uh, previous health system. So, I have an impression that this scenario is something that will happen in the absence of strong class politics that keep socialistic ideals in organizing our basic needs in place. The case of Indonesia might be a good example, but this Indonesia is now moving toward the so-called now new normal. What happened now and what is dominant in the discourse are ideas about how we deal with this pandemic in individual ways, in economic terms. The new normal did not question about the poor health system that taken doctors and nurses' lives when they fought bravely against COVID-19. It just left to the community, individuals, or the society to, to deal the problem in their own terms, while government main interest is to keep the economy and investment alive. So even when the number of infected people keep soaring under the new normal situation until today, we are already in the condition to make business as usual. I think uh, I'm afraid that we will soon forget and leave this socialistic measure very soon. We are still uh, under the condition happy to embrace ne neoliberal policies in our health system with a fallen fiscal forgotten. So in conclusion, I think there is one important issue here. Our task today as scholar as well as ordinary citizen in this region is to make the ideal of socialistic principle in public policies alive. The commodification of our health system is, I think, one important agenda in our movement to build a better society in the future. Uh, okay, that's uh, my uh, point. And I will give it back to Fernando again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swan. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Andy. Thank now, you, Dr. Dr. San Juan, you, you may points raised by our reactors. Okay. Yeah, so uh, firstly, I uh, would like to thank uh, both uh, Professor Borja and Dr. Andy for their very insightful comments and uh, very valid questions. So, uh, with regard to uh, Professor Borja's comments, I think that the basic question that he's asking is that, is the Philippines capable and willing to implement these reforms, specifically the healthcare reform that we, we all prefer somehow. No? I think that the Philippine government is generally capable. No? We have the funds, we have the money, 
we, we, we still have billions left in the coffers. No? So for example, Banco Central has still uh, has donated or has loaned uh, the Philippine government 300 billion pesos, no? cash, cold cash. And the Philippine government is yet to totally account for this amount. So there's no question about the money. We, ha we have the capabil capability to, to, uh, to finance uh, genuinely free healthcare, universal healthcare uh, system for everyone, especially if it would be single payer. Now, as proven in researches about the system in the United States of America, say for example, it's the cheapest and most efficient system. Um, so that means that, yeah, all governments are virtually capable of doing it because nowadays we actually have two systems. So we have public insurance, field health for which uh, workers are required to pay and also the employers are required to pay. And we also have the more expensive insurance in the form of private insurance. And actually, employers and employees in big firms are paying for it. So we have plenty of money going around to these, uh, going to these uh, private insurance firms. So my idea and, and the idea of other uh, supporters of uh, the single payer system is to put all these funds in just one big fund, publicly managed fund, which will be the national insurance system of the Philippines. And, and hence, we are very capable of doing it. But with regard to the willingness, yes, I will admit that with the current government that we have, with, uh, with the kind of uh, elite uh, classes, political classes, uh, clans dominating our system, yes, it will be very difficult because there are politicians who are directly connected to these private healthcare interests. So th that will be very difficult no, to change this willingness. But the answer lies uh, to the question posed by Dr. Andy, I think. No? Uh, he, he pointed out that my paper somehow uh, missed discussions on the organized classes, radical politics, etc. Yes, I admit that uh, this is not uh, uh, the topic or the focus of my paper because the main objective of my paper is only to convince people that socialism is good and better. But I, I, I yeah, I, I accept it, and and yes, I also, I I'm also uh, part of that broad social movement. We, we we are all part of this broad social movement that that needs to prepare the ground to help labor unions strengthen themselves to once again fulfill their historical task of leading all these transformations. Because they have already proven this role all throughout history. Say, for example, with regard to the movement to uh, institute the eight-hour work day or week, eight-hour work day, rather. Mm -hmm. It's the workers who led that movement. With regard to the women's right to vote it's also the labor unions you know, the, the, the 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 women led labor unions that led these transformation and and there are plenty of examples worldwide so hence i agree that yeah we we need to tackle all these things how to help the organized classes the labor unions strengthen themselves so as to prepare for the coming battles but but in, in, in preparing the labor unions for these battles, in preparing the workers for these battles, I think that uh, the, the academe uh, should play this role of uh, always documenting what's happening, always trying to uh, make sense of what's happening, just like what we have done. And, and, and it's very good to document no, that the government has, has done all these things has used government funding for this big intervention in the economy because it's proof that we have the capability to resolve the, the current problems that we have. Yeah. And going back to the uh, second question of uh, Professor Borja, should we provide aid to labor unions instead and uh, support cooperativization rather than finance or subsidize the business firms. I would agree that, yes, that would be better. And I will surely include that in my future discussions, papers, and advocacies. It's just that at the height of the pandemic or, or in, the, in the early weeks of the pandemic, it's really very difficult to, to, uh, to argue that the government should, should put the money to the labor unions or to the cooperatives because 
at that point the displacements the massive displacements are already happening so i think that it's 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 also a good idea to to support the government in their effort to support business for as long as uh, the condition is set that that those businesses will not uh, displace the workers and and they will use the the money that the government gave them to save those workers from displacement but yes in the near future i think that we have to ensure that money is going to more socialistic policies really socialist policies such as cooperativization of industries oh. and again that will be going back to dr andy's main point and that that point is something that i would like to emphasize too there should be bottom up organization you know? there 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 should be uh uh the strengthening of the workers peasant organizations organizations of professionals to support all these socialistic policies because as i've mentioned just like the philippines just like many southeast asian countries uh most of the governments that we have today are representatives of elite interests and the only way for them to change the course of their governance is for the masses for for the broad sectors of society to 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 really have a say on what's happening you no know? and and that would be only possible if uh all these sectors are willing to engage in more combative more proactive uh forms of struggles and that would be uh, another discussion or paper thank you Thank you, Dr. San Juan. Now, um, I'd like to remind our participants that if you have any questions for our lecturer or even our reactors, you may type them in the public chat box. Okay, uh, but please identify yourselves uh, in your question. Uh, there, there is one question uh, in the chat box at the moment, but it's not directly related to the lecture actually. Uh, it comes from uh, Mr. Virgilio Meneses of Tondo, Manila. And the question is, can, can the anti-terror bill help solve the COVID-19 crisis? So it's a, a, a bit off topic. And um, of course, I mean, if you'd prefer not to answer the question, you're welcome not to do so. Well, we can uh, try to answer it. The, 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 the answer would be, no, it will not help resolve the crisis. It will only uh, worsen things no? because we need mass testing. We need help or aid for uh, small and medium enterprises, aid for our farmers, for our workers, for our teachers and other professionals who have been displaced by the pandemic. We don't need a law that will uh, terrorize the organizations that actually help all these sectors or people. No? So yeah, the anti-terror bill will only make things worse, especially for the basic sectors that Dr. Andy and Professor Borja have been mentioning. The basic sectors that are important or that will play major roles in transforming society. This anti-terror bill will actually uh, try to uh, persecute or legally harass these organizations of workers and it's happening. We, we all know that it's happening. No, uh, every now and then, no, uh, state security uh, forces, uh, the, their web web pages or Facebook pages, always feature propaganda materials linking legitimate workers, peasant, professional organizations to underground organizations to justify uh, their their labels of their or these organizations as terrorist organizations. Hence, uh, yeah. The anti-terror bill will only make things worse. Okay, thank you, Doctor San Juan. There's actually a question for um, Doctor Andy. Okay, um, again, Doctor Andy, it's up to you if you'd like to respond. But it comes from Mary Lisa Bonifacio Balendo, okay, who is based in Indonesia. The question is, uh, what and how do the or does the Indonesian government address the same issues? raised by Dr. San Juan. So yeah. would you like to answer that? Yeah. Yes, uh, short note, but 
I think it's quite the same yeah, as uh, Dr. San Juan uh, mentioned earlier about how uh, the government respond to tackle the problems of uh, cash transfer for the poor when the quarantine uh, established in the early February or March. And then the question about how to deal with the distribution of food, uh, how we deal with the problem of the poor uh, in the urban areas, especially the urban areas, because uh, the urban area uh, are the most affected uh, regions. So yes, the government allocated the budget to provide uh, the poor for the, at least the basic needs. But I think I have an impression that uh, the policy sometimes uh, quite not uh, right because uh, usually the government transfer or give the poor with not the money, but food that already uh, provide like uh, noodle, instant noodle, oil, uh, margarine, something like that, that uh, many poor people already accepted, already have it. But what they need is, I think, I have impression that shelter. So that's why uh, the Indonesian government uh, could not tackle the issues about how people moving from uh, the urban centers to the interior or move to the other uh, other region. Also, the government already inhibited or uh, banned the transportation to that area. So I think, yeah, that's the problem. As, uh, yeah, for the background, Indonesia already has uh, what we call Puskesmas or community health system. It was funded by the government. It was, uh, it is uh, specifically uh, designed to deal with uh, uh, small symptoms or before they go to the hospital. But I think in general, we have the same problems that the government must think much more in terms of economic or investment development. What uh, the most fear is about the economic collapse following the crisis, and especially the industrialists or uh, private sectors already uh, said that we could not uh, uh, keep our workers working for one month or three months, another two months. So what the government, government should do? That's why I think the new normal is the way the Indonesian government uh, find the solution that uh, gave up <laughs> uh, its uh, responsibility to deal with this problem. And just, I have an impression that it's hurt uh, immunity being in place in Indonesia today. That's the problem. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, thank you, Doctor Andy. Uh, we have another question from Mr. Joseph Manook. And uh, the question is basically, what countries do we consider successful in combating COVID-19? And uh, would you consider the leaders of these countries socialist? I think that one of the most successful countries in uh, fighting COVID-19 is New Zealand uh, because they're now back to normal. But their leader is not really socialist, but she is somehow left left leaning you know? i think it's she's from the labor party of uh, new zealand so it's somehow a social democratic uh, a party so it's it's to the right of a typical socialist but it's to the left of a typical liberal party so i, I guess that yeah that that shows that there, there's uh there's credence in the idea that socialism can can help us in fighting covid-19 because New Zealand has a leader that is very close to the socialists, especially that they have implemented their lockdowns in a very humane and, uh, uh, shall I say, friendly manner. No? So, so the, the, the police there did not went around the town uh, arresting everyone, etc. So it's a, it's a very humane lockdown. And yet people followed 
the rules and the lockdown. Because the, the, the key is that the government financed or subsidized at least 75 to 80 percent of the salaries or wages of many of the workers. So they will have nothing to worry about. So they, 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 will, have, they will have to stay inside the house for the lockdown. And hence, they, will, they were able to beat uh, the disease earlier. And now they have zero cases. And another successful country would be Vietnam no? in, in, in Southeast Asia. I think that they are yet to have a casualty. Um, although, yes, they're, they're just a nominally socialist country. I would argue that uh, they, they have retained you know, the, the, this idea of uh, uh, swift government response to any emergency, which is very typical in both historical and current uh, self-labeled socialist countries, say, for example, like Cuba. So, yeah, and, and the third country that is somehow successful in fighting COVID-19 is, of course, socialist Cuba. Because it's not only fighting COVID-19 in its own country, it has deployed uh, hundreds of doctors around the world, especially in third world countries, and even in developed countries like Italy, to help uh, people around the world beat the disease. So I think this is testament to the validity of socialism as the superior system. No? America, the biggest capitalist country, is asking everyone, send us your nurses, send us your doctors. Meanwhile, you have this tiny socialist country uh, beset with their own economic problems because of the trade embargo and, and imposed by its uh, big neighbor, the United States of America. And yet this small socialist country is able to help in its small way by, by sending its doctors in third world countries and even first world countries to help fight COVID-19. Yeah, so that will be my answer. Okay. Now, um, well, again, just a reminder to our participants that uh, this discussion is an academic discussion. And uh, I hope that your questions will not dig the primary theme of the lecture, which is responding to COVID-19 through socialist or socialistic measures. Uh, but we have a question from a student from Ateneo and UST, uh, Patrick Celso. And the question is, how can universities or institutions involve students to be more holistic uh, immersions regarding the response to the pandemic? Yeah, uh, yeah. I will give my answer. I think that our two, our other colleagues can also provide their answers. So yeah, that would be on a voluntary basis because uh, schools cannot require uh, students to participate in uh, efforts to fight COVID-19. But one good idea perhaps, considering that uh, students are techy or technologically aware, you know, uh, perhaps uh, schools can have an online survey send all this survey to their students and ask them, here's a checklist of what the school is doing right now. Can you check all the, the items that, in, in which you think you can contribute something? So, and, and it can be manpower, it can be financial resources, etc. It can be uh, uh, the use of technology online to do this and do that. So yeah, that can be the most basic that the schools can do, I think. We're actually over time at this point. Um, I'd like to ask our actors, do you have any parting words for our participants? Maybe Mr. Borja can be the first to share his parting words. Yeah. Again, uh, thank you for everyone who attended this webinar. Uh, parting words would be simple. This, the current pandemic is not only a medical question, it's not only an economic question, it is at this point, especially with the, an inept national government, it is a political question. So the next elections would be very crucial in trying to convince this national government to harness the potentials and resources that it has. Dr. Andy? I think uh, this pandemic also opened our horizon that 
the other alternative is possible. So I think that's the importance of this uh, webinar discussion that we will, we can uh, broaden our view or broaden our horizon about our better life in the future. And Dr. Dr. San Juan, any parting words? Yeah, I, I hope that uh, this presentation um, was able to deliver on the go on the basic goal of encouraging people to read more about socialism, to be curious about it, and eventually to be convinced that this is a better system than the, the than the one that we currently have, capitalism. So and and yeah, and I, I invite everyone to to read more about socialism and eventually to to join uh, my fellow socialists in and shaping and building a better world away from uh, the current messy and chaotic world that we are in. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So on behalf of the Southeast Asia Research and Hub, I'd like to thank our first our participants for joining us this afternoon. I found this to be a very interesting academic discussion. Okay, and I hope that uh, the ideas you heard today will uh, make you challenge your thoughts, your preconceptions. Okay, but again, uh, this is well, this is not intended to indoctrinate. Okay, at least on behalf of search, the, the intention is not to indoctrinate, but again to discuss this interesting topic from which we may be able to pick up some uh, lessons that we can apply. Okay, to the to addressing the current crisis that we are facing. Now, um, again, on behalf of SEARCH, I would like to thank our reactors, Mr. Borja and Dr. Andy Akdian. Okay, thank you for your insights. Okay, your, your, your comments definitely enhanced this discussion. And uh, of course, last but not least, So thank you very much and good afternoon. Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Sampai jumpa. Bye. Thank you. Salamat. Salamat. Salamat, sorry. Salamat. <laughs>